Hello, everybody. I'm Bob Abbey, Adult Services Librarian for the City of Forest Grove, and I want to welcome everyone watching on uh, our Facebook uh, page and our YouTube channel to this evening's program with Eric Wagner called After the Blast, The Ecological Recovery of Mount St. Helens. Uh, before I bring Eric into the live stream and before I uh, turn the proceedings over to him, I want to make just a couple of quick announcements about some of the things that we've got coming up uh, that I hope you will be interested in. We've got some uh, really interesting programs coming up uh, this month and next. So uh, at the end of October, October 7, uh, excuse me, October 27th, also at 6.30, also streaming live on Facebook and YouTube, we have three prominent historians from the area, Jan Dilge, Dr. Kimberly Jensen from Western Oregon University, and Jean Ward, who's a professor emerita at Lewis and Clark. And they're gonna be here talking about the current state of research around the um, suffrage movement. Um, as you may know, 2020 is the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment nationally. Oregon got the vote in 1912, but they're going to be looking at a variety of topics related to Oregon suffrage history. And then on Tuesday, November 10th, we'll be inviting uh, Portland uh, dream researcher Kelly Bulkley uh, who writes for, among other things, Psychology Today, to talk about dreams and um, what we know about why we dream, how we dream, what uh, our dreams tell us, and also uh, how current events might influence uh, our dream content. So both of those programs will be streaming on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel starting at 6.30. Um, and we'll be doing more programming here in a live stream format throughout the uh, foreseeable future until we're able to welcome you all back into the library. Um, one of the benefits of live streaming is that it is interactive and uh, you are more than welcome to use the chat function to ask questions or make comments. Um, during Eric's presentation tonight, I'll be backstage collecting those. And when he's done, we'll get together and um, I'll be able to share those with him and he can answer your questions uh, at that time. Um, so we're very fortunate to uh, have with us tonight, Eric Wagner. Um, I should mention, Eric told me just before we, um, went on that uh, Seattle is experiencing a windstorm right now. And uh, he said his internet may go out. It went out a little earlier today. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that that doesn't happen. Um, so please send out all your best live stream good vibes that we don't have any connection problems because this is a really fascinating presentation. Um, Eric is um, the author of three books. Um, actually, let me get this up here. So this is Eric. Now, um, I believe this is actually up perhaps around the Plains of Abraham uh, at Mount St. Helens. I can ask Eric when he's um, on if that's the case, uh, the pumice fields. But Eric lives up in Seattle. He's the author of three books, including Once in Future River, Reclaiming the Duwamish, which was published in 2016, Penguins in the Desert, which was published in 2018, and his most recent book, After the Blast, The Ecological Recovery of Mount St. Helens, published by the University of Washington Press in 2020. Eric has a PhD in biology from the University of Washington, and his essays in journalism have appeared in The Atlantic, High Country News, Orion, Smithsonian, and several other places as well. So we're very fortunate to have him with us tonight. So. I'm going to bring Eric into the stream. Hi, Eric. Hi. How are Hello. you? Uh, fine, thank so, you. So, so I want to. I just want to ask very quickly the uh, the picture that's in your bio. Is that up at the Plains of Abraham? It is uh, on the Pumice Plain, actually, and right in front of the mountain. The Plains of Abraham are a little bit to the east, but okay. um, 
yeah, they were, that's uh, some mammal trapping that I was helping with a few years ago. And I'm holding a little deer mouse that is not happy to be held. Oh, okay. But was released. All right. Well, um, so Eric is going to be um, presenting tonight. He's got um, a wonderful set of slides that he has uh, presented uh, in numerous places. And I, in fact, saw Eric present um, online through the Mount St. Helens Institute. Um, and I had also finished reading his book. So uh, I knew that I wanted to have him here to speak with us about this amazing uh, ecological recovery. Uh, 2020 is also the 40th anniversary of the eruption of Mount St. Helens. So we're, we're marking that event with uh, Eric's presentation tonight. So Eric, I'm gonna turn this over to you and okay. I'll be back when you're done and okay. uh, we'll field some questions and comments. All right, thank you very much. All right. So I will share my screen. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> this is always the, here we go. Okay, everyone can see and hear me according to the widget. So here we go. Hopefully now you can see this. So yes, um, thank you, Bob, for kind introduction and for inviting me to speak. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining uh, remotely, as I wish we could all be in person. But alas, we must have the next best thing. Um, yes, yeah, so as Bob mentioned, I'm talking about my new book, After the Blast. Um, and this is still technically the 40th anniversary of the eruption of Mount St. Helens. People think of, uh, of May 18th as being this very singular date, but uh, the, the actual eruptive period from that time actually lasted until from 1980 until 1986. So if you want to get technical or maybe a little pedantic, you could say that you're enjoying the 40th anniversary of the eruption of Mount St. Helens for another six years or so. So. Um, this is what Mount St. Helens looks like today, uh, for, as seen from the Mount Margaret backcountry. Uh, this isn't my picture. Um, I think I might have grabbed it like from an REI catalog or something, but you can tell that this is a very sort of iconic way of seeing of uh, Mount St. Helens, you know, from the north, looking into the crater, um, the, you know, the blast area sort of laid out in all its glory. And in this way, Mount St. Helens is a real sort of regional marker in the Pacific Northwest. And because of this, sort of everybody remembers, everybody who was alive and, you know, cognizant in 1980, remembers where they were when they heard about the mountain going. And in this way, the sort of the eruption of Mount St. Helens is in this way a very known story. And so sometimes when I was working on the book, and I, I did research for this book for about five years. Um, I, you know, people would ask me, oh, what are you working on? And, and I would say, oh, I'm writing a book about the eruption of Mount St. Helens and say, oh, the eruption of Mount St. Helens, huh? You know, what are you gonna say that's new? And at the time I was talking to all these scientists and reading all these papers and I was really struggling to wrap my, my arms around of all this research that had come out of the eruption, um, that had come out after the eruption. And so to be asked, you know, oh, what are you gonna say that's new? And it's everything for me was new and I was, I was struggling with it. So I kind of grumble and mutter and stuff like that. But so hopefully it, what I wanna show in this talk is some of the stuff, the new stuff that's come out um, in the 40 years since the eruption. So first I want to situate the mountain for you. Um, Mount St. Helens sits in the Ring of Fire, the Pacific Ring of Fire, which is, as you can see, it's a, it's a line of, of volcanoes, some active, some not, that starts in, from the, runs from the southern tip of South America up through Central America, um, across North America, across the Aleutians to Russia and Japan, um, down into Indonesia and Malaysia, and then kind of peters out a little bit in New Zealand. Um, it's a 25,000 mile arc with hundreds of volcanoes of which 400 are still active, 400 or so. Um, and Mount St. Helens sits in the Cascade Range, um, which is a, is a range of 18 active volcanoes. It runs from Southern Canada, although this image is from the US Geological Survey. So apparently Canada doesn't exist, but it runs from Southern Canada to Northern California. <clears throat> and Mount St. Helens is the youngest of the Cascades volcano. Um, it's uh, the vent over which it sits is only about 40,000 years old. 
And the prominence, uh, which is what we sort of conventionally think of as the mountain, is only about 4,000 years old. So in geological terms, Mount St. Helens is just a baby. Um, but it's a very squawky baby. Mount St. Helens is the most active Cascade volcano by far, and uh, it erupts about every 140 years on average. Not that you necessarily would have known this in 1980 or 1979 or leading up to the eruption, because to look at, this is a photo from 1979, and you can see that Mount St. Helens then was just the, it was, it was a sort of a perfect peak. Um, it was known as the Fuji of North America, and it was, you know, its, its summit, its peak was almost perfectly symmetrical. And it owed that beauty, it owed its beauty uh, to its youth. Um, since it was so young, the, its glaciers hadn't had time to carve up its summit as they had at Mount Rainier and nearby Mount Adams, both of which are much older. But in the spring of 1980, human and ge geological time horizons began to converge uh, when a series of small earthquakes in the mountains si uh, signaled to volcanologists that magna was on the move up into the prominence. And so, from beginning in the middle of March and going through uh, through April and into May, um, there were a series of small earthquakes and a magma chamber fill, formed under the north flank of the mountain and began to fill. And it was expanding. The chamber was expanding throughout March and April, sometimes as much as five feet per day. And it formed, it caused what, as you can see here, is this enormous bulge on the, on the north flank. And there are also occasional steam eruptions. Um, blasts of, of steam and ash that coated the snow on the mountain and made it all kind of dark and, and sinister. And uh, a crater opened on the summit. Uh, it's opened to about a few hundred feet wide and there were cracks on the summit. And so all of this signaled to geologists that something was going to happen at Mount St. Helens, but they didn't know precisely what and they didn't know when. And so there was a good deal of sort of uncertainty and controversy over how to, to to react to an event that may happen or may not happen, and you know how big it would it be, how destructive would it be? Nobody knew the answers to any of this. And so, this is what Mount St. Helens looked like on the morning of May eighteenth, nineteen eighty. This is a this is a photo taken by Gary Rosenquist, who was camping in Bear Meadow, which is about eleven miles to the east. And this photo was a photo he took at eight twenty seven a.m. And at 8.32 a.m., an earthquake that registered 5.1 on the Richter scale rocked the mountain and the summit and north flank collapsed um, in what at the time was the largest landslide in recorded history. So, so billions of tons of rock and glacial ice just slid off the mountain and people who were flying over the mountain described it as, as looking like water just flowing away. And when that happened, so up until then, all that rock, all the, the, the bulge and the, the, the face of the mountain had the pressure of all of that rock had kept the magma within the chamber contained. So when the, when the landslide happened and, the, and all that rock roared away, suddenly there was no pressure, you know, the, the, all the pressure in, that, in the chamber was released and it exploded out in a, in a burst of, of steam and shattered rock and, and gas in what's called the lateral blast. So this was first was the landslide and then came the lateral blast. And so these were a series of photos that Gary Rosenquist took over the course of about 30 seconds. And this is what the lateral blast looked like seen from the west. Um, so it, where the landslide, so when the landslide started, the, the rocks slid away and they were going about, people later estimated about 150 miles an hour, but the, the lateral blast clouds flew out at up to 600 miles an hour. It's one of those things where there's a there's a floor speed. People say over 300 miles an hour, but they they were they were very quick and they just raced over the land and they knocked over all the trees. And then after the the lateral blast came, the uh, a, a big sort of pillar of ash began to grow from the mountain and um, it billowed about 500 million tons of material they later estimated of ash and pumice just climbed in an eruptive column. And in just a few minutes it had climbed 15 miles in the sky and prevailing winds blew it east. Um, it eventually ash would cover seven or dust be found 
in 17 states, uh, um, you know, all over basically the Western states and then as far south as Oklahoma. And the ash cloud, the, um, it climbed, it eventually climbed up into the stratosphere and circled the earth uh, in about two weeks. And so another process that happened later in the afternoon, so while the ash, the ash is billowing out, the ash would billow out for about nine hours or so. And in the afternoon, a series called pyroclastic flows began. And this was when um, pumice, a sort of a foamy volcanic rock, began to boil out of the new crater of the mountain and rush down the north base. Um, and so this happened throughout the afternoon, just wave after wave of scorching hot pumice. And so the main eruption, what's called the catastrophic eruption, lasted for nine hours. And by the time it was done, this is more or less what was left, this, this you know, fairly apocalyptic scene. Um, Mount St. Helens had shed about 1,300 feet in height. And there was, in the place of that perfect summit, was a crater that was over a mile in diameter and 2,000 feet deep. And this is what was left from a landscape perspective. So one of the things that was really interesting about the eruption of Mount St. Helens was that rather than erupting up, which is what most people expected, that was what you thought, you know, what most people thought volcanoes did was they just erupted up. Mount St. Helens had erupted out. And as a consequence, you know, the, the, its effects had kind of spilled out over the landscape. And so that created this very discrete kind of blast area um, in the, you know, mostly to the north that covered about 234 square miles. And as a consequence also of all these different processes that I mentioned earlier, the landslide, um, the lateral blast clouds, the ash plume, the pyroclastic flows, that left behind a number of distinct disturbance zones. Um, and so this is what they look like. This is a map of them from the US Forest Service. So you can see there's the blast area, which is sort of everything, you know, sort of that is encircled with orange. And then, but you can, and that's about 234 square miles. But then you can see all these other sort of features of it. So the orange is actually the scorch zone. And that is at the edge of the beige, which is the, the, the blowdown zone, which was the extent of the lateral blast clouds. So the blowdown zone where it's all the, the, the trees that were knocked over by the lateral blast clouds. And then you can see the yellow that runs down the Toodle River Valley is the debris avalanche zone. So that all the landslide debris or the, the landslide material, the rock and the ice and mud and other organic material plunged down the valley and went about 14 miles. Um, and then in front of the mountain, as a consequence of the pyroclastic flows is what's known as the pumice plain. And that's an area of just that was just completely buried up to 120 feet of, of uh, pumice. And I should mention the debris avalanche it buried the Toodle River um, under up to about 600 feet. And the blowdown zone, so that, you know, it knocked over all the trees, but it didn't actually have that much of a deposit. So that was, you know, maybe a, a few inches at most or a foot. And then the scorch zone was where the blowdown, the lateral blast clouds, where they, by the time they'd reached about 17 miles, which is the farthest they'd traveled, they dissipated in energy, but they're still hot enough to kill the trees. And so that left a series, you know, of of kind of dead sentinel trees, snags, bleached white snags that kind of show the extent of, of, the, of the cloud. And so this is what um, ecologists saw when they first were able to visit the blast area about two weeks after the eruption. So they'd been really keen to go, um, but they'd had to wait, they'd had to be patient because there were a lot of, there were search and rescue operations and also geologists having been taken so by surprise by the eruption were, were very hesitant to let anybody in. But, so ecologists, when they finally were able to go, they were mostly just restricted to helicopter rides. And so they're flying over um, the blast area. And this is what they see mostly. So on, even on these sparkling clear days, they would just see this landscape that was entirely gray. And I mean, just to look at it was to, to, to conclude that there was just no hope of life. There was, there was no chance that anything had survived. But at the same time, because they're ecologists in a little bit perverse this way, they also looked at it as a tremendous opportunity. So here is a chance to watch life creep slowly back into an area that had been just sort of drastically denuded and devastated. And in so doing, they would be able to test some of ecology's older and more durable theories about how life recovers from a disturbance. 
So a few weeks after the eruption, it wasn't until a few weeks after the eruption that they were actually able to land in the blast area. And so the first helicopter ride, and this is sort of fabled in Mount St. Helens ecological lore, was taken by, um, by Jerry Franklin and a couple of colleagues. And so they flew to a place called Ryan Lake, which is about eight miles north of the mountain. And they landed and, and they put on their hazmat suits and they put on their helmets and they were, you know, they were instructed to get ready to run in case the mountain erupted without warning, which it was still doing. And Jerry Franklin hops out of the, the helicopter and what does he see at his feet but a little tiny green shoot. And he recognized it, I mean, he's a plant ecologist and he recognized it as a fireweed shoot. And this is what fireweed looks like as a grown up, um, as a mature plant. So fireweed is very, very common. It's found all over the world. Uh, it's a classic pioneer species. Um, and it's gets its English common name from the fact that it is often one of the first species to show up in a, in a, in a place that has been burned by usually forest fires of which we are all too familiar right now. Um, <clears throat> but it's also like in England, it was known colloquially as bomb weed because it was one of the plants that would that would grow up in bomb craters after um, during the blitz. So it's a fireweed is as a as a species. It's a you know a classic pioneer. It prefers disturbed habitats. And so Franklin is looking down and he's seeing this classic pioneer species. And what he realizes is that it had to be it had to be from a shoot. Um, it couldn't have been from a seed because it was only it was a early July and, and the fireweed hadn't gone to, gone to seed yet. So it had to have been a, a little bit of remnant root that somehow had survived under all of that mess of down trees and everything, and then sprouted and was, and was coming back to life. And he realized that in a way that, you know, Mount St. Helens was perfect for fireweed and fireweed was perfect for Mount St. Helens. Um, as a species, it grows very, very quickly. And and this, as what I'm showing, is a series of three photos that just looks at a patch of land over the course of a summer. So fire, you know, as you can see, there's not much here. And then the fireweed comes and it grows very quickly. And then at the end of the summer, it sprouts and it produces thousands of seeds. And these seeds are all very small and they're covered with little, it's a little tuft. And the seeds can travel very far. The wind picks them and can carry them for miles. And so in this way, fireweed, you know, it, it can occupy empty space and grow very, very quickly. And it's really, really good at it. And at Mount St. Helens, it did it a lot. But the thing also that Franklin realized is it wasn't just fireweed that he was seeing. Um, there were several other species. This shows uh, some huckleberries growing in the roots of, of a downed tree. And then here's some pearly everlasting growing up through cracks, uh, a crack in the ash. So um, the ash, you know, that had come from the ash ball would, would crack and, and, and the pearly everlasting was able to, to reach down and, and, you know, come and find some old soil. So this was not what ecologists had expected at all. And it, very quickly they realized that rather than a decades long recovery from zero, in some places the post-eruption community response would be rapid, it would be diverse, it would be full of surprises. And what the, their sort of overwhelming feeling was that they really needed to study it. They needed to, to be able to document all the, the way the species came back, the, the sort of interplay between what was within and what was without, as they watched what would be a faster repopulation of the blast area than, than they anticipated. And in part because of the scientific, or scientific efforts, the Mount St. Helens National Volcanic Monument was created in 1982. And the monument is about 110,000 acres, most of which are north of the mountain. And as it was designated in the sort of originating legislation as a place for geologic forces and ecological succession to continue substantially unimpeded. And so the idea was that this would be that Mount St. Helens was kind of this amazing natural laboratory and, and we should treat it as a natural laboratory. We should, you know, not, not mess it up, not, not intervene. We should not impede it as, as the phrase goes. And so subsequent research has shown that there are two main influencers on what, what would happen in the blast area. And these were survivors and colonizers. And survivors 
were the sort of biological legacies from the pre-eruption community, like the fireweed, um, like the other plants, but it wasn't just plants. It could also be small mammals and amphibians. Uh, it could be living organisms or dead organisms, such as the tree trunks um, that would provide shelter for, for other plants or animals, um, root wads and things like that. So it was a real, it was a, it, you know, a com complex sort of group of, organis of organisms um, that would constitute survivors. And then of course the colonizers who would come from outside the blast area in, as, in the sort of more expected fashion of, of things, seeing open space and then, and then occupying it. <clears throat> so within this sort of survivor colonizer framework, there are two classic examples. Um, the first on the left is the Northern pocket gopher, which is the classic survivor. And the one on the right is the prairie lupin, which is the classic colonizer. And you can read about both northern pocket gophers and prairie lupins in After the Blast. But one of the things I should say is that while I was doing research for this book, um, there was a biologist that I hung out with a lot because he'd been working there for, he's been working at Mount St. Helens for about 40 years. And he would he would sometimes say, oh, you know, pocket gophers and prairie lupin, pocket gophers and prairie lupin. All anybody wants to talk about is pocket gophers and prairie lupin. Please talk about something besides pocket gophers and prairie lupin. And so, yes. Adhere, you know, giving into his wishes, adhering to his wishes, honoring his wishes. Um, the rest of the talk is going to be about something other than pocket gophers and prairie lupin. But it will still be a survivor colonizer framework. And so the colonizer I want to talk to you about is the rainbow trout. And the survivor that I want to talk to you about is the elk. And I think of these as more sort of modern colonizer survivor mascots for the blast area. Uh, because for me, if, if, you know, they illustrate some of the tensions that are inherent to the monument's aims and purposes um, as, as, you know, as we mark the 40th anniversary of the eruption. And so I want to start with the colonizer, the rainbow trout. So the rainbow trout is a salmonid, which means it's in the same family as Pacific salmon of the uh, genus Oncorhynchus. Um, it's a really popular game fish, as you probably know. Uh, it's been introduced all over the world. Um, and, you know, there, there are, uh, I don't know, many, 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 many different strains of rainbow trout, you know, Columbia red sides and all sorts of things. I'm not a fisher, Men, so I can't, I can't do all the rainbow trout chapter and verse, but there is quite a chapter and verse about rainbow trout. But for me, um, in, the, in the sort of Mount St. Helens verse, the rainbow trout is the story of Spirit Lake. So this is Spirit Lake pre-1980. Um, you know, that, that picture with Mount St. Helens so beautiful and, and symmetrical. Uh, at the time, it was a pretty typical Pacific Northwest mountain lake. Um, it was deep, it was clear. Uh, its nutrients, it had pretty low nutrient levels, so it was what you would call oligotrophic. And as you can see in this picture, it's also a pretty popular recreation site. Um, there are people sailing and swimming. Its shores were, um, were sort of, I don't want to say littered, but there were a lot of uh, cabins and lodges and camps on the shores. It was, you know, Boy Scout camps and things like that. Um, and it was just a really, it was a really popular place to visit. It was, it, you know, Mount St. Helens was often perfectly reflected in it and, and Spirit Lake suited the mountain well and the mountain suited Spirit Lake. But this is what Spirit Lake looked like after the eruption. Um, as you can see, it's quite a bit different. And so what had happened was with the, de with the debris avalanche, so when all of that material was sliding off the mountain, it slid in three distinct blocks. And so the first block slammed directly into Spirit Lake. And it created a, it may have slammed, I mean, this is one of the, the you know, the eruption is full of all sorts of fun, fun speculations that, you know, you can, that people sort of bandy about, although there's no sort of official paper about it. But um, so the, the, the landslide, the block may have slammed into the lake with such force that it created a, a siege or a giant wave. And, and the, the fun speculation is that it may have hit so hard that the basin, the entire basin may have emptied for a moment as all the water rushed up the hillsides. And so 
as the water is rushing up the hillsides, the lateral blast clouds have already, because they're so fast, they've roared over the forest that was surrounding Spirit Lake and knocked over all the trees. So all this water flows up the, the hillsides, gathers up all the trees and soil and dead animals and all sorts of other stuff and drags all of that back into a lake. <clears throat> and so that's what you can see on top of the lake is what looks like this kind of skim. It's actually tens of thousands of logs um, that were knocked down and dragged back into the lake. Excuse me. And immediately after the eruption, the log mat, as this is called, covered about 40% of the lake's surface. And as the years have gone by, many of the logs have sunk. Um, they sink at sort of species specific rates. So now the log mat covers maybe about 20%, but it's still really impressive. And you can see it if you're, there are a few points along the Highway 99 where you can look down and see the log mat as it kind of swirls around. Um, the wind often bunches the logs up into uh, one of the arms of the lake, or if there's no wind, then they just kind of go in this this loose Brownian motion. And it's quite mesmerizing. Um, but the other thing, so the other sort of salient facts are with all of that material plunging into the lake basin, the bottom, the lake bottom was raised about um, 200 feet. And so the surface area of the lake expanded from about 1,300, it nearly doubled from 1,300 to about 2,200 acres. And then of course, there were all the logs floating up top. So this is the lake that researchers faced when they arrived uh, in 1980. This is an image from the southern shore looking out. Um, and it is quite, I don't know, formidable. Um, it was, the lake itself by that point was a black stinking broth. Uh, helicopters that had flown over the lake immediately after the eruption had assumed that it had boiled away because there was so much sort of ash and, and crud on top of it that they didn't think there was actually a lake there. They just thought they were looking at that solid ground. But there was a lake and it was it was in, it was pretty nasty. Um, the water was 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 black. Uh, there was that nothing had survived. I mean, unlike the land where there would be these sort of fun little tales of of finding you know, little pocket survivors and things like that. There was clearly, you know, nothing, nothing lived in the lake. Um, and immediately it became anoxic, um, all sorts of gnarly bacteria did very, very well. Um, there were two, they eventually, researchers eventually uh, discovered two new species of Legionella uh, bacteria, which is the, which is the species that cause um, Legionnaire's disease. And they named them uh, Legionella uh, St. Helensy and Legionella spiritensis to commemorate their origins. But one of the interesting things about Spirit Lake was that its dynamics would be almost completely the opposite of land. So while the, while the terrestrial researchers were watching things kind of creep back in or sprout in these you know, kind of little by little ways, um, the lake, Spirit Lake, almost, you know, as, as fall and winter came, received a great influx of snow and rain, and that quickly cleared the water. So what you're looking at on the left is a, is a water sample taken from August 1980, and on the right is one taken from 1981. And you can see the very obvious difference that, that 1981, the lake, has, has cleared considerably. And so... Shortly, you know, once the lake cleared, photosynthetic organisms could return. Um, phytoplankton and zooplankton were found uh, in 1982. And by 1983, the lake was pretty much totally clear. And so this is what Spirit Lake looked like 24 years after the eruption. Um, it's, if it's, this is one of the things where you would say, oh, the lake recovered, but it isn't exactly a recovery um, because, you know, as, as many of Mount St. Helens biologists told me, a recovery presumes a return to an original state. And it is not like Spirit Lake had returned to its original state at all. Um, it had gone from being oligotrophic to eutrophic, which means there are a lot more nutrients in it now. And as a consequence, there are a lot more plants, um, there are a lot more organisms, uh, aquatic invertebrates, um, amphibians, and things like that. And, but there was one sort of set of organisms that biologists were particularly interested in, state biologists in particular, wanted to know about fish. So several lakes around Mount St. Helens had been stocked before the eruption, and Spirit Lake was one of them. Um, the Spirit Lake had received about 40,000 rainbow trout per year, uh, fry being sort of dumped in the lake. From beginning in the 
you know, I'm saying that almost 1913 until 1979, uh, they're putting tens of thousands of rainbows into the lake every year. And what this picture shows is a biologist doing a survey of another mountain lake in in the Mount St. Helens in the Mount Margaret backcountry. And he's what they would do is um, they would go out, they would fly out in a helicopter, they would set a gill nut that they would bait with uh, canned chicken, or if they're feeling more fiendish, they would bait it with tuna. And then they would come back the next day and see if they caught anything. And as you can see, this, uh, this is a picture from I think 1982, um, that this biologist has has caught fish. And so fish had survived in um, in other backcountry lakes. And one of the reasons for this was that when the mountain erupted in May, many of these lakes were still covered with ice. And so, you know, the, the fish under a thick layer of ice would be aware of this, you know, rumbling and, and suddenly this, you know, great darkness would pass overhead. But then uh, life more or less went kind of back to normal. I mean, the fish um, that the biologists caught in their other surveys, you know, they weren't, they weren't thriving, they were kind of stunted, but they were alive and, and they were kicking and that was, that was, you know, good news. Um, so while, you know, the state biologists started doing surveys of these lakes in 1981 and 1982, but no one really bothered with Spirit Lake. Um, there were occasional surveys, uh, but, you know, Somebody would go throw in a net in Spirit Lake, but they never came out with anything. And then finally in 1983, um, some biologists were out and they did their thing. They threw out a net, they came back the next day and in it, they had a single male trout and a, a rainbow trout. And they were so shocked, um, they could not imagine how it had possibly gotten there. And they named it Harry uh, after Harry Truman, who was the cantankerous owner of the Spirit Lake Lodge or the lodge on Spirit Lake. Um, who had, and he had famously refused to evacuate and then was killed on the morning of the eruption when the, when the landslide just buried him under hundreds of feet of rubble. And then the next year they came back out in 1994 and they caught a single female rainbow trout, which they duly named Harriet. And so biologists kept returning and they kept serving and they would catch a few rainbows each year, but you know, it was nothing to really write home about. And then finally in 2002, these two uh, biologists here, um, Bob Lucas in the front and John Weinheimer in the back, both from the Washington Department of um, Fish and Wildlife, went out and they, you know, they were, they were doing a, a rod and reel survey and this enormous trout just erupted out of the water. And that they said is when they knew that Spirit Lake had finally turned a corner. And you can see the trout that they're hauling up here. And so, Spirit Lake rainbows, as they as they continued to catch them, they they found that the Spirit Lake rainbow trout in Spirit Lake were doing very very well. They were big and they were bitey. Um, they had basically the entire lake at their disposal, and they were some of the largest rainbows found, or freshwater rainbows found anywhere in the world. Uh, just real lunkers, you know. Most of them were over two feet long. They weighed more than four pounds. Uh, where the trout had come from was a bit of a mystery. Uh, there are all sorts of some apocrypha uh, about, you know, so and so came, you know, people came and introduced them, you know, dumped some more trout in the lake until they caught. There's also a, um, uh, some biologists are investigating whether the trout may have naturally recolonized from a population of, uh, of steelhead on the, on the North Fork of the Toodle that may have been able to reach Spirit Lake when a creek that used to connect the Toodle to Spirit Lake um, was was temporarily you know temporarily reconnected the lake before it stopped. So suffice it to say that where these trout came from, you know nobody really knows, but they were there, and because they were there, uh, Mount St. Helens, the biologists decided that they should be studied because they you know there, there were all sorts of questions that you could ask about them. What are they eating? Where are they spawning? And over the years, what they found is that the um, the trout treat Spirit Lake essentially like an ocean. Um, they, you know, they spawn in the tributary streams and then they migrate out to the lake and they spend a couple of years there and then they migrate back to the to the lake or to the to the creeks to 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 spawn. And the biologists they were also finding something else. Um, where before the the when there weren't as many of them, the trout were enormous, but as their numbers increased and they increased quite rapidly, the trout themselves started to shrink. So, and they were losing a constant amount of length and weight 
each year. And so even though there was the same overall biomass of trout in the lake, they were just smaller. There were more smaller fish rather than a few really big fish. And this led to a bit of a, a fracas because um, when people began to hear about all these enormous trout at Spirit Lake, there was a real you know, clamoring to be able to go fish for them. You know, people remembered Spirit Lake as a place where you used to be able to go fish uh, for trout. And so the state was really interested in opening a recreational fishery, um, partly because sometimes that, you know, when the biologists would go up to do their surveys, they'd bring volunteers with them and the volunteers would come back with these tails of enormous fish. And now, you know, the, the, there was a sort of you know, fear that those enormous fish were disappearing. But the federal managers of the monument, um, because the monument is federally managed, they said no, um, and they've so far said no. And the reasons, most of them are, are safety. There's only one trail currently down to Spirit Lake. Um, at uh, Harmony Falls, which it's about a mile long, it's really steep. And the other problem is that if anybody tried to take a boat out onto the lake, they would have to deal with the log mat. And woe betide the angler who is so focused on reeling in the lunker that they don't notice all these enormous logs that have surrounded their boat. Um, there are some, some, some researchers who have pretty harrowing tales of having been out in boats on the lake, and then they suddenly realize that they're surrounded and they have to ram their way back to the shore before they sink. So for now, there is no fishing at Spirit Lake except for this sort of thing, which is a biologist um, doing what he calls a hook and line survey. And so for me, this is what makes the trout sort of a, a new interesting, you know, colonizer mascot of, of Mount St. Helens, um, where the prairie lupin was, was sort of explicitly ecological. It was just a plant that showed up and nobody knew why. The trout is quite a bit more complicated. Um, it was introduced by people before the eruption, and then the mountain cast all the trout out, and then it was brought back, most likely by humans, but you never know. And as a consequence of their presence, there's a real debate, you know, what is the monument for? What constitutes natural and what is unnatural at Mount St. Helens? And these are tricky questions that nobody really has a good answer to yet. And so now I'll move to the new survivor, elk. So this picture shows a bachelor herd on the pumice plain, um, you know, proud and antlered. And one of the things with large mammals like elk is um, they did not fare well in the eruption. Uh, 1,500 are estimated to have been killed along with 5,000 deer, uh, 200 black bears, uh, some unknown number of cougars and bobcats, etc. These large as biologists called them, above ground fauna. You know, they couldn't hide in burrows or bury themselves in the snow. Um, so there would be, you know, they, they were all just blown away. And so because of that, the approach, the scientific approach to these large mammals would be different. Um, there would be no, you know, no search for survivors, but you could learn from the dead because their bodies could be found. And so what this shows, this picture shows, um, an elk skeleton that's been dug up from the ash deposits. And biologists that, you know, who did this sort of work often likened it to kind of a Pompeii, the city that was buried by ash when Vesuvius erupted. And they would find these elk skeletons sort of perfectly, you know, sort of arranged where, you know, basically they died where they lay. Um, many of them did. Some of them were, were thrown through the air by the lateral blast clouds, but, but a lot of them were just sort of succumbed um, in the ash, you know, suffocating and then you know, just getting sort of steadily buried. And sometimes um, they're, they're sort of, I don't know, I don't want to say they're delightful, slightly ma delightfully macabre stories of, um, of biologists sort of walking over these desolate wastes and then seeing a little patch of green. And sometimes, and that green, they would go and they would dig and they would find that they were seeds sprouting, germinating from the guts of a dead elk. And so, but the thing was, is that by finding these skeletons, um, as they were, you know, being dug up, two biologists were able to initiate a study on elk cabin grounds. So elk herds, um, when it, when females get pregnant, they often separate themselves from the herds before giving birth. I mean, the typical sort of elk herd you think of is a mix of males and females, and then 
um, during the rut, you know, dominant males will round up a bunch of females and mate with them. But then after, once the female's about to give birth, she would, um, they, she would leave and go off to a sort of private calving ground. And part of this was, was safety. Um, you know, if you separate yourself from a large mass of similarly tasty animals, maybe a cougar or something is less likely to find you. But for uh, biologists and managers of elk, there was a real you know, question of where were these, where were these cabin grounds? What sort of areas did pregnant elk like? <clears throat> and this, this was in the pre GPS days. So before, you know, now what you do is you just slap a, a GPS collar on an elk and, and, you know, you can basically follow its movements down to the, to the inch. But in those days, what you had to do was put a radio collar on an elk and then kind of you would just go stand on some exposed perch with an antenna and listen for the beep, beep, beep that told you that the collar was near. And then that way you kind of try to triangulate until you could locate the animal. Um, so that was one day to do it. Or you could wait for a volcano to erupt, you kill all the elk where they lay, and then go dig up their bodies and find out where what the sort of you know territory that they liked. And so that's what biologists did. Um, this, they mapped the skeletons and they noted which were females with calves or fetuses. And then they would, they were able to sort of identify the particular types of meadows that those, that those pregnant females liked. And what this shows, this is um, a picture from an offsite storage facility of the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture from the University of Washington in Seattle. And this is what they call their Mount St. Helens elk herd. So all of those boxes contain elk skeletons um, that had been dug up as part of the study of the, you know, what they called the crispy elk study um, from, of, of sort of habitat preference of females. And, and yeah, and so, but not all the elk died. Um, the Mount St. Helens herd is about 10,000 elk strong. So even though 1,500 died, there was still, you know, a pretty substantial portion of the herd that was left over. And so many survived just outside the blast area. In some cases, you know, right at the edge. Um, you can see that this image is taken by a, a, a biologist named Evelyn Merrill or Evie. And she told me a story about, um, she had been studying elk at Mount Rainier and then Mount St. Helens erupted and she immediately transferred her, her study space to go see what was happening down there. And so she would go and try to find elk. And she told me a story about looking at elk sort of watching her walk through the blast area. And she sort of peered up at them through binoculars because their silhouette was a little odd. And then she realized that what had happened was that the blast the, the blast cloud had burned off their ears. They didn't have ears. So there were just these sort of twitching nubs where their ears had been. But so the animals that survived, you know, they were highly mobile. Um, so they were some of the first animals to return to the blast area. and. Um, and you know because elk can, are big and they can move, and their initial forays were tended to be quick and brief. Um, but then they ventured farther and farther in, and in part they were drawn by those early surviving plants, fireweed and other things that um, Dr. Merrill called elk ice cream. This you know they would come in in the summer and gorge themselves on you know this abundance of plants in, in places. And then in the winter, they would forage from grass and seeds that had been planted in the debris avalanche area for the purposes of erosion control. And as a result, their rebound, the elk's rebound in the blast area was pretty swift. Um, in 1981, um, biologists were counting, they counted about 200 elk in the blast area. And by 1985, that number had tripled to about 600 elk. And this picture shows a mixed herd on the debris avalanche deposits, you know, and they're, and they're, it's a common sight now is to see large herds of elk just sort of roaming around. And so as you might imagine with a large herbivore sort of moving as it will, there were consequences for the recovery or the, the response, the biotic response at Mount St. Helens. And at first, um, the elk were largely beneficial. They were almost entirely beneficial. Um, so elk, when they would move into a place, they would poop and their droppings where each was like a little prill of fertilizer. And so this is a picture of, of elk poop with um, some prairie lupins growing up through the middle of it. And the other thing uh, that elk did is they, they just walked, they would walk far and wide. And so this served kind of two functions. First, um, they were vectors for dispersal. Uh, their seeds would be trapped in their fur and uh, 
these would you know just sort of fall off in different places. And the other thing that elk did was the um, their tracks would break up the ash. So one of the things that prohibited plant growth was the the ash um, coating, which could sort of you know if it got wet and dried afterwards, it would form this kind of hard crust that a that a seed couldn't get through. But then a herd of elk would stomp through, and suddenly you know. The, elk, the ash wasn't quite so intimidating anymore, and the and the plants would be able to grow. And so they were, you know, the elk were ranging far and wide throughout the blast area, stomping around, transporting seeds, and um, you know, doing well for themselves and fairly well for the plants. But success came at a bit of a cost. So as the elk numbers were increasing, they began to run out of food. And once they were running out of food, they begin to starve. And the winters at Mount St. Helens can be pretty pretty chilly. <clears throat> and surveys that the WDFW started in 1989 found that over 150 elk might starve over the course of a single winter. And starving elk, the image of starving elk, upset people in the communities outside the monument that surrounded the monument. Um, there would be these videos of elk with their hides stretched taut across their ribs, flopping around the ground on the ground too weak to stand up. And there were, there was, you know, there's this general sense that people just didn't really like to see nature take its course quite like this. And so <clears throat> as a result, uh, the supplemental feeding programs in the winter were begun by the, uh, by the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Sometimes what they would do is they would truck up this hay, uh, you know, large bales of hay from Oregon, and they would create these food depots. And so that's what this picture shows, a bunch of elk waiting to be fed. Um, and the, the efforts continue uh, in 2019, um, there were uh, over $300,000 in grants from the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation for habitat enhancement in the winter, which is generally understood to be feeding. So in the years since then, the elk herd has largely stabilized. And as it has stabilized, its successional influence has begun to change from one that was largely positive to one that is considerably more mixed. Um, and so what this picture shows is a young uh, conifer growing up in the debris avalanche that has been heavily browsed by elk. You can see the top looks sort of conventionally tree-like and the middle and bottom are shorn down almost uh, to the trunk. And this is, I mean, this is an interesting sort of image in two ways, because one is the elk browse, but also is the presence of the conifer, because in sort of conventional plant succession um, ecology, the arrival of evergreens, large trees like this, signals a sort of a, a, a beginning of the end, if you will, of the successional process. So, you know, now that firs and uh, pines and spruce, um, but mostly firs and some pines, have begun to return to the blast area. There's, a, there's an understanding that now the forest is coming back, you know, that the pumice plain, which is so famously, you know, treeless, now there are trees and some of them are quite tall and you can see them sort of marching back up the slopes of Mount St. Helens um, to form, you know, the forest that had been there before. And so, but the elk are kind of, a threat to this process because not only you know their browsing damages the trees, um, but now they're as they walk, which before was breaking up the ash. Now what they do is they stomp on on new plants. And some one biologist told me that you can see that a herd of elk passing through an area can set succession back about a decade. I mean, just by you know by treading on everything, tearing stuff up, and then. You know, by you know, the plants basically have to start back over as if it were just 2010 instead of 2020. And so this is definitely, as they say, you know, succession interrupted. But the question is, you know, is this succession impeded, which is, you know, what they want to avoid, that they want su ecological succession to be substantially unimpeded. And so because of this, because of the growing number of elk, um, people stepped in, uh, not for the first time. So the first elk hunt uh, around Mount St. Helens actually took place in 1982, um, as you know, there were, there were elk sort of amassing on the edge of the blast area. And the irony is that the the aim of the hunt was to control their numbers so that they didn't 
you know, overrun the blast area. But in effect, what it ended up doing was driving all these elk into the blast area and into the monument, which was a de facto refuge for them because no hunting was allowed. And so that was what introduced elk basically compelled them to the heart of the blast area where they took up residence and have since been, you know, causing such quote unquote harm. And so in 2005, uh, monument ecologists advocated for an, a limited hunt to try to drive the elk out of the heart of the blast area, away from the pumice plain, more towards the edge of the monument where they could be more sort of conventionally managed. Uh, it didn't quite work out that way. Instead of having a limited hunt, you know, just one or two years in the pumice plain, um, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife opened a hunt on the on sort of the Mount Market backcountry and some other units. And, you know, so the elk were not, were not driven out. They were, you know, driven back in. Um, and as a consequence, they continue to occupy much of the blast area quite comfortably. And they look like they are going to stay there for some time until something new changes. And there's all sorts of, you know, there might be a new hunt, maybe wolves will arrive. Um, nobody knows, but that those sorts of things are years off. And so that, for me is what makes elk as kind of the, the interesting new mascot for survivors um, because they present a real sort of test on the phrase of ecological succession substantially unimpeded. And the, then the, you know, the question is unimpeded by whom? You know, elk, by the elk, which are a natural part of the landscape, natural if you will, um, they were part of the landscape before the eruption. They came back on their own, they were, you know, unassisted and they show, I mean, you know, by their movements in and out of the blast area, they kind of stitch the idealized space of the monument with the kind of messier, more contingent world outside of it. And they show, I mean, but mostly what they show is like, you know, because I like this picture, they show just how Mount St. Helens will always be this really beautiful and complex, complicated space that, you know, is, is, always sort of presents you with more questions and answers. And so that's kind of what I want to close with is this is an image. Um, this is a time lapse from NASA, a NASA satellite showing the blast area uh, from 1979 to 2016. And so I kind of want to return to that first, you know, admonition, I suppose, by, by the people who had asked me, you know, what's new? And um, I think the thing, you know, the sort of lessons that Mount St. Helens teaches us 40 years on are that things will come back. You know, life is really resilient, um, even in the face of a seemingly unfathomable disaster. You know, things survive and things can return. There's a, there are sort of the, the foundations for a community. But the proviso is that it may not, life may not come back just as you expect it to, as you plan for it, or even as you want it to. And you know, because of this, you just have to, it's just a place that's full of surprises as you watch the sort of the green creep back and back. And, and you know, even as the years go by and the green sort of fills in this space, there's still a lot of space left to be filled. And so that's one of the things that's really interesting is as the, as the research goes on at Mount St. Helens and the older original researchers hand off their work to, to newer folks. The question is, you know, what are they going to find? What surprises are they going to turn up as, you know, as they look another 40 years, hopefully 100 years, who knows? But there are all sorts of plans and they're really, really interesting. And I, and I will say that I'm envious of the person who gets to write the book, you know, 20, 30 years from now that looks at the ecological recovery of Mount St. Helens from that new perspective. But in the meantime, I hope you enjoy my book. Um, and thank you very much for coming and now, or listening, joining me. And now I'm, I'm happy to take questions or hear stories about Mount St. Helen. I will stop sharing. Bob, I think you're muted. Here we go. How's that? Here we go. There we go. <laughs> ah, yeah. Uh, so I think one of the um, one of the things that everybody has who has been around for a while is some some Mount St. Helens stories, certainly about the eruption, um, and so many of those images that you showed have become just iconic. Um, now, when you talk about 
the impact that the blast had given how far the impact reached? I mean, given the fact that ash did travel quite a ways, um, do you do you sense that there's any um, kind of gradation uh, as you move farther away from the oh, mountain? Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, that, um, that's definitely one of their main findings was that the, the, um, the distance from the mountain really influence the degree of the disturbance. And mm -hmm. so, you know, especially it, with say the, the pumice plain, um, which was, you know, just covered with hundreds of feet of, or over a hundred feet of scorching hot rock um, versus the, um, there's a researcher who studies, who studied the ash fall and he worked at these two sites. I think one was 12 kilometers away and the other was 22 kilometers. Um, and so looking at the degree of disturbance there, he was able to show how a little bit of ash in one place meant a completely different, you know, had a, prompted a different response and a little bit less ash in another place. And there are all sorts of interesting interplays. So yeah, I mean, definitely the closest, the closer you were to the mountain, the worse you fared. And um, as, as the, you know, the farther you travel, the less likely you are to have been heavily impacted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The um, the thing that strikes me as I um, spend any time around the mountain, particularly on the north side, um, is just the diversity of uh, biosystems. I mean, the mm -hmm. the area the area right around the the plains of Abraham, which is um, pumice and paintbrush and pinstemon and yeah. uh, not, not much else mm -hmm. and um and then the the mountains or the hills nearby with the uh, trees that are completely blown down still right um and then you move up around the area around mount margaret mm -hmm. and that's again yet a completely different sort of biosystem um can you talk a little bit about that kind of biodiversity i mean i think i think we may assume that that uh, that region is fairly uniform, but it is quite diverse. Yeah, well, I mean, part of it is, so you're looking at two different successional processes. So in places like the Pumice Plains or the Plains of Abraham, you're looking at primary succession, which is um, basically, you know, a completely empty landscape and, and things, you know, the flowers that come back, the pinstem and the grasses, fireweed, things like that. But then as you move into Mount Margaret in the blowdown zone, that's called secondary succession. And so that's when there's, um, there is going to be the surviving community. That's where um, Franklin and, and his, his work mostly took place was in that area of secondary succession. Mm -hmm. And so um, you see much more of that interplay between, you know, the pre-eruption community and the post-eruption community, or I mean, the organisms that were in the pre-eruption community and then the, the post-eruption community that's made up of both them and the colonizers. And, and so that's, yeah, I mean, it's the disturbance sort of matrix around Mount St. Helens is, is fascinating in that way for in some ways, the very sort of clear delineations between these communities. Um, and especially that's true in the pumice plain where uh, I would say one of the things that was really cool about it was that um, a lot of those the successional studies, the sort of successional dogma was done by inference. You know, people would go look at places of glacial retreat and then they would do this kind of time reconstruction. So they would assume that, you know, if some distance from the glacier is X hundred years and then more years and more years. And so, you know, this is, this period of a community, this is this period of a community, this is this period of a community, but you're just assuming that, you know, the the youngest community is doing X, Y, or Z. But at Mount St. Helens, they actually got to watch that, that youngest community come in. And what they found was that there were actually very few rules about what, you know, to, to sort of govern the, the organisms that were able to do well, especially plants. Um, and so, I feel, I feel like I'm straying a bit far from your question, but it was kind of neat. You know, there are all these, even within what seems like a a uniform space, like the pumice plain, where you would look out and there's this sort of wonderful eruptions of of wildflowers. 
um, every you know every spring, I, I highly recommend that everybody go visit Mount St. Helens when the wildflowers are in bloom. But um, that can, that you know palette just conceals this this sort of mad scramble and anarchy on the part of all these individual organisms. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's just remarkable. Hmm. You talked about um, the communities around the mountain and the relationship that they had or the reaction that they had um, to the images of dying elk. What yeah. is the relationship of the communities to the mountain? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's complicated. Um, I mean, part of the thing is this, there's, these were communities that before the eruption really depended a lot on tourism. Um, and after the eruption, you know, their relationship with the mountain really changed because, you know, suddenly they're not able to go relate, you know, play at the mountain like they used to be. It's not that same sort of free space that it was before. Um, there's a pretty, I don't want to say constant, but there's there's a consistent sort of pressure from you know Cowlitz County um, commissioners and and sort of the towns around to to try to reopen the mountain to more sort of garden variety Pacific Northwest recreation, um, and I mean it's you know it was one of the things that you know the researchers they have you know I mean I'm I'm a biologist by training so my my sympathies kind of lie with them and they have I think good reasons for wanting to keep the blast area and the monument you know as a research space but you have to feel a lot of sympathy and and you know compassion for people who are just suddenly sort of you know dealt with the you know the sort of the violence of the eruption I mean there was a huge economic impact in the area I mean you know the unemployment shot up um, you know suddenly all these forests weren't up weren't weren't open to harvest anymore you know you couldn't hunt in these places and so i would say that the yeah the the relationship especially between you know researchers and and folks in those places is a little bit it's it's cool mm -hmm. <laughs> um mm -hmm. you know i I, th I think yeah I, hmm. so um your previous uh, books have dealt with uh, the relationship, uh, particularly the, the Duwamish, um, and you've looked at Magellanic penguins. Um, what was the trajectory that took you to Mount St. Helens? Huh. Um, <laughs> it was kind of mercenary. Um, an editor at the University of Washington at the press was like, because um, when I was starting to work on the Duwamish book, um, she said, oh, you know, I really want a book on Mount St. Helens. Would you be interested in it? And I, I grew up in Astoria, Oregon. And, and so I, you know, my dad, uh, he was a photographer for a long time at the Longview Daily News. Um, you know, and so we would, our, as a family, we'd go to Mount St. Helens a lot. Um, and so in that way, it was kind of this formative space of, you know, I, I just kind of knew it, but I, I was, I didn't really know it. And so I wanted to know it a little more. Um, mm -hmm. I think part of it also was, I just become more interested in trying to write about um, local, you know, sort of regional spaces after the, after the penguin book um, and just getting to know the really, the more sort of fascinating features of the Pacific Northwest landscape. Mm -hmm. And also um, the it's, I mean, before the pandemic, kind of played havoc with everything. One of the things that was funny was that um, I actually, you know, the fact that the book was published on the 40th anniversary was a lucky accident because I missed my original deadline by a year. But the way I sold that to the editors was, oh no, now you can publish it on the 40th anniversary. <laughs> It'll line up perfectly. And so, and I guess, I mean, that was part of it too, was I, I mean, as, I, as you start working on it, you realize that, um, a lot of the folks who've been there for 40 years are, are getting on and, and they're starting to retire. And there's a sense of transition at Mount St. Helens now mm -hmm. um, between their work and the work of younger researchers who are coming in and bringing new sort of scientific lenses, new ways of seeing things, new ways of dealing with data. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it was, it was kind of neat to 
to catch Mount St. Helens at this moment of transition, um, mm. you know, mm -hmm. at least from a scientific perspective. We have a question from uh, Jason. He's asking about um, whether Mount St. Helens has had wolves in the past. And ah. Will the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife consider reintroducing them if that was the case? That's a really good question. Um, so I bet they did have wolves in the past. I mean, wolves range pretty far and wide across Washington before they were totally extirpated in 1900s. Um, the the main biologist in Mount St. Helens is a fellow named Charlie Christofoli, who you'll, if you do read this book, you'll read a lot about. <laughs> and he um, he is really kind of counting on wolves coming back and restoring some of that predator prey balance where the elk are concerned. Um, the, at present, there is no plan to reintroduce wolves, as Charlie says, you know, in this part of the state, the last thing you want is for some federal scientist to be talking about bringing wolves back to, to ranching country. But, uh, the nearest pack is, I think the Tianaway pack, which is about 90, 90 or so linear miles away. And so, I mean, as they, you know, wolves are, are moving, um, they, you know, creeping across and they're popping up on on the west side of 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 i5 here and so it's probably you know it's only a matter of time before they eventually reach mount st helens and when they when they do eventually get there they're going to find a whole bunch of elk and a lot of open space that um could really could really use their influence hmm. um i want to wrap up with uh, more sort of a personal uh, observation from you we've chatted um uh, about how uh, we both uh, spend time around the mountain and uh, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how the work you've done has changed your thinking about the mountain and your relationship to it when you climb or when you go up and spend time around. Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, that's a tough question. So one of the thing, I mean, I, well, it's just such a, I think the thing with Mount St. Helens is that I always felt like it was kind of resisting. Um, I really, when I would go there and I mean, you realize just how big a mountain is and how kind of impossible it is to grasp, um, which was not a good feeling when that was what you were trying to do in kind of book form. But to stand, I mean, there were a lot of moments where, I guess the thing that I really liked a lot was how, um, you know, most of you, before working on this book, I was really familiar with Mount St. A very particular sort of face of Mount St. Helens. There's like Mount St. Helens is a mountain with a face, you know, the north, the north face, the crater. That's what everybody, you know, that's what everybody sees. That's where you are directed when you go to the monument. I mean, whether to Windy Ridge or Johnson Ridge observatories, you're supposed to look into the crater. And so, but the thing that I really enjoyed was all the different ways of looking at the mountain, like from the east and from the south and from these, these, very curious vantages where you'd see these, it was like taking, you know, this, all these different facets of the mountain that, that I'd never thought of before and never seen before. And, and that really was what I enjoyed the most was, was always sort of looking for a new way to see, see the mountain kind of every time you go. And I guess that was the thing that I really admired the most about all the biologists who've worked there is that they're always sort of looking for that new way to see the mountain, even as they're asking, basically the same types of questions, but they know that the answers will give them a new, a new sort of way of seeing. And I, I really, I really like that part of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, that's a great way to approach anything that we experience out in the, in the wild is to, uh, to be open to experiencing it from different perspectives and to be surprised and to, uh, to just follow that wherever it takes us. And, and I agree. I think that's one of the surprising things about Mount St. Helens is the different vantage points and yeah. how each side is really presenting a different face of the mountain yes. um, and, and how close you can get to the mountain, particularly when you're yeah. walking around the Plains of Abraham. Mm -hmm. It's right. right there. It's, yeah. uh, it's right in your face. <laughs> yeah. It's a real rare feature for a mountain in the Pacific Northwest to really feel like you really feel that it's almost this kind of vertigo. If you're right there and it's right and you can almost reach out and touch it, but, mm -hmm. but you can't and it's still, I don't know, there's really something. Yeah, yeah. Well, Eric, thank you so much for taking time out tonight to uh, talk with us about the ecological recovery of Mount St. Helens in the 40 years since the eruption in 1980. And um, uh, folks, definitely, it's a wonderful book. It provides lots of great insights into how 
biologists have really changed their minds about uh, what it means to sustain life in the face of uh, a, an almost total cataclysmic event. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that's not a bad message to think <laughs> about now, right? <laughs> in a slightly different way, but, right. uh, but uh, life does go on mm -hmm. and uh, life yeah. finds a way. It ends well, our beginnings. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Well, Eric, again, thank you so much. And uh, everyone, we will see you back here in two weeks for uh, our pro program on Oregon's suffrage history. Good night, everybody. We'll see you right. soon. Thank you for coming.